There are four analogies to God's people that are used in commonality in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. First of all, there is the family of God. In the Old Testament, of course, it was the physical family of Jacob, later called Israel, and then his 12 sons and their descendants. Then there's the sheep of God. The kingdom of God, which was physical Israel. And, of course, the army of God, which, in many cases, took out the enemies of God's people, like in conquering the promised land. In the New Testament, the family of God are those that are born of water and the Spirit, and we all have God as our Father. That's his church. Amen? Well, we're the, the sheep of God, and Jesus is our shepherd. We're the kingdom of God, not in a physical sense, but we are the spiritual Israel of God. And we are the army of God to conquer this world. The title of our lesson focuses on the last of these. The title of the lesson is The Spiritual World War. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 12. In verse 1. A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. Now, the woman represents the Jewish nation. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she's about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And of course, her son is Jesus. Amen? Amen. Now read on in verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough. And they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil or Satan. Who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth. And his angels with him. Verse 17. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman. And went off to make war against the rest of her offspring. Those who obey God's commandments. And hold to the testimony of Jesus. The woman was the Jewish nation. Her firstborn was Jesus. And the Bible says, Then Satan made war against the rest of her offspring. Who are her offspring? The rest of them? They're disciples of Jesus Christ. Those who obey the word of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus Christ. We need to understand that biblically speaking, Satan has brought the war to this world. And the Bible says he leads the whole world astray. You know, I understand that for a great many disciples and many people in the world, there's a great aversion to war, and in some cases, rightly so, when man kills man. And certainly that was the case back when I was growing up during the days of the Vietnam War. As a matter of fact, uh, back in those days, there was a draft in the United States. And in my freshman year of college, when I turned 18, they had a draft. And I still remember all of the guys that year in the fraternity and trying to figure out whether or not we're going to be drafted. And generally speaking, they would announce a birthday, and they would go through all the birthdays of the year and attach a number to it. And usually about the first third of the birthdays of that year would then be the guys that would be drafted. We're listening, you know, number one comes, number two, number 19, May 31st. I go, oh my goodness, that's my birthday. <laughs> now, fortunately, that day, that, that particular draft was the first draft they didn't take anybody. But if they would have, I would have been a part of it. And yet, myself, like so many, had a strong aversion to in what many called an unjust war. You know, these aversions go a lot because of hideous atrocities that have happened. You know, we think about in Iraq, Saddam Hussein. 
it's fairly well documented that in that war, he killed off 100,000 Kurds to take control of that nation. But it's not like Iraq is the only nation with atrocities and wars. In Vietnam, there's the famous My Lai massacre that the U.S. committed and Lieutenant William Calley was blamed for and most likely a lot of his superiors should have been. But in that particular massacre, 500 innocent, mostly women and children, were slaughtered by American troops. Of course, perhaps the greatest atrocity that we've known in the last century occurs in World War II with Adolf Hitler and the Holocaust, where in the so-called final solution, the extermination of the Jews, six million Jews were killed. Most of them incinerated and put to death. Unknown to a lot of Americans, not only were there six million Jews killed, but there were also five million Slavic people put to death as well with this so-called ethnic cleansing. You know, I remember going over to preach at the church in Munich, and one of the brothers says, bro, you need to go over and see the concentration camp at Dachau. And you know, there was a, I didn't really want to go, because I, I knew that it was just filled with horrors, but, but I went because I had a sense of history. And I'll never forget going, because they'd set up the concentration camp so people would not forget the atrocities. And you walk through a, a corridor of several pictures, but three pictures stood out. The first one was a long line of mostly women and little children with stars of David on their clothes walking into this building that supposedly was where they were going to take a shower, which in fact was just simply poisonous gas that was going to kill them. The next picture that struck me was, I mean, it was just, just took my breath away. It was a picture of all their shoes because they were made to take off all their clothes and all their shoes. And they had literally shoes piled several stories high. We're not talking a few feet high, but several stories high of shoes. And you knew that the owners of all of those shoes had been put to death. The last one was just a hideous picture of an open grave. When the Allies finally came, there were scores of charred bodies, emaciated from hunger. Many men, women, and little kids. And so we understand the atrocities of war, and we should rightfully have an aversion. On the other hand, we need to understand that the war that the Bible speaks about it's not a war that we started, but a war that has been brought to us to take us away from God. In fact, to lead the whole world astray. Our main text today is going to be 1 Samuel chapter 30. And some of the insights today I need to, to thank ahead of time, uh, Jay Hernandez. And uh, Jay wrote an article that will appear next week. And... Uh, You'll see some of the, the insights that uh, the Lord gave him that he shared with me. And I'm very appreciative of that. But let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 30. Keeping in mind that in both the Old Testament and New, the concept of the army of God being his people is just as strong as the concept of the family of God. We pick up the action here. That David and his men are now outlaws from Saul. Saul is the established king of Israel. And yet, in his reign, he's gone into more and more evil. In fact, he's even wanted to kill David himself. And so David flees from Saul's presence. As a matter of fact, even flees from Israel. A group of noble men rally around him that we later call the mighty men of God. Amen. And so we pick up the action in chapter 30, verse 1. David and his men reached Ziklag on the third day. Now the Amalekites had raided the Negev and Ziklag. They had attacked Ziklag and burned it. And they had taken captive the women and all who were in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on their way. When David and his men came to Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire. And their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. David's two wives had been captured, Ohinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Camel. 
David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and his daughter. But David found strength in the Lord his God. Amen, church? Then David said to Abiathar the priest, son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. Abiathar brought it to him, and David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? Pursue them, he answered. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. David and the 600 men with him came to Bezor Ravine, where some stayed behind. For 200 men were too exhausted to cross the ravine. But David and 400 men continued the pursuit. Verse 17. David fought from them till dusk until evening the next day. And none of them got away except for 400 young men who rode off on camels and fled. David recovered everything the Amalekites had taken, including his two wives. Nothing was missing. Young or old, boy or girl, plunder or anything else they had taken. David brought everything back. He took all the flocks and herds. And his men drove ahead to the other livestock saying, This is David's plunder. Wow. That's exciting. Amen, church? I mean, right here, we see that David was forced into war. The enemies of God, the Amalekites, had taken captive his wife and all the wives of the guys with them, as well as their sons and daughters. As a matter of fact, the Bible says they wept bitterly to the point they had no strength. And then, how fickle we are as people, they turned on David, wanted to blame David for all their problems. Amen, guys? And prayerfully, we learn a lesson as leaders right here. David turned to the Lord. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Well, we find he inquires of the Lord, should I pursue him? The Lord says yes. Interestingly enough, 600 men were so, ex 200 of the 600 were so exhausted they couldn't go any further. And so David takes the 400 men, fights the Amalekites, wipes them on out, brings back all the wives and the children and some plunder. You know, it's, uh, it's very interesting right here because we have no sense that this war had any sense of injustice, but rather... Justice. Why? Because their families were held captive by the enemy. You know, today the Bible says that Satan has led the whole world astray. And I believe the, the number one way that he has led them astray is in false religion. And he has held them captive. I don't know about you. I mean, doesn't it take you back when you hear that a hundred thousand Kurds died? That atrocity? Doesn't it blow your mind that 500 mostly women and children in Vietnam died at the hands of American soldiers? Doesn't that just get, get your blood boiling? Doesn't it still take you back, even though it's many years ago to the Holocaust and over 11 Million people were killed in the name of ethnic cleansing. Doesn't that get you going a little bit right there? Well, how much more so as disciples? Shouldn't it get us going with the atrocities of Satan? Today, the fastest growing religion in the world is Islam. It has two billion adherents. Satan is holding captive all those people to the point in their minds they think they're serving God and they're killing Christians. They're held captive. There are one billion atheists and agnostics in the world held captive by Satan in the name of knowledge. They think they know so much. There are almost a billion Hindus, a polytheistic religion. A half a billion Buddhists held captive by Satan. You can go on and on. Sadly, there are 50 million Jewish people thinking they serve the God of Abraham and his present covenant. There are 500,000 Scientologists. And you know, perhaps the greatest atrocity, though, doesn't lie with these mindsets, but false Christianity. There are approximately 1.5 billion 
false Christians in the world today. And so many of them think that they're saved because they believe in Jesus. Half of those people believe in infant baptism. They think since they've been baptized as a baby, they're good to go. The other half believe, well, I believe in Jesus. I said a little prayer. I'm saved. And that's an atrocity that far outweighs. Even Hitler's atrocity of 11 million, Satan is holding captive 1.5 billion people claiming to be Christians, and yet their lives utterly denying it. I have three simple points today. The first one in this spiritual world war is we need to battle for every soul. In Acts chapter 4 verse 12, Peter says there's no other name under heaven by which we must be saved except Jesus Christ. And the church said, Amen. In John 14, 6, Jesus himself says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In Acts 2, Peter lays it on out. He says the only way to become a faithful follower of Jesus Christ is you've got to have faith in Jesus. Understand that your sins put him on the cross. In response to the cross, you want to repent of your sins and become a disciple, and then you're water baptized to receive the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. You know, today, we're going to watch Daheem Smith make that decision. Yeah. Here's a young man that's experienced all the things that the world could offer, and he's seen the emptiness of it. And today, we've gone on in there, and we've gotten them freed from the captivity of Satan. You know, Elena and I were away, as I spoke about earlier, in Las Vegas this, this weekend to minister to Dan and, and Denise Triana. Earlier in the week, I, I got a phone call from Dan. He says, bro, we just had a huge tragedy. He says, what? He says, Denise's mom just passed away suddenly. I said, what happened? He says, well, she, she, she lives with us. She was in extraordinary health, thin 68 years old, she went to the bathroom at 4 in the morning and just died. Just cardiac arrest. The medical examiner said that she died right on the spot because they say when you die, there are little bubbles that, that show in your eye if there's been any length of time that you've struggled to live. There are absolutely no bubbles whatsoever. She died instantly. And even if there was a medic right on the spot, probably she wouldn't have been able to have been revived. It was just her time. The tragedy of it all was that Deanie thought, well, I have my mom living with us. She loves my family. She sees our witness. We share our faith. She sees the Bible study. And now she's gone, and she's not a disciple. I mean, she was just devastated. We went on over there Friday, and we were just going to stop by a little bit over at the house, and we found out she hadn't eaten for about three days. So we said, hey, come on, Dini, Dan, let's, let's get out of here. Let's go talk. And so we dragged her on out, and we were able to spend a, a few hours with her and encourage her. The funeral was tough. I don't know whether you've ever had to do or be a part of a, a funeral of a non-Christian versus that of a Christian. I mean, just even a few short months ago, we had... Lou Jack's father passed away, but he was a disciple of Jesus Christ, and that was a celebration. Amen, guys? Because we know everybody's going to die. And they asked me to do the funeral, and I have a deep conviction. When you do somebody's funeral, it's a time like no other time when people are forced to think about their mortality. Most people just push it out of their mind. I remember when, like, the insurance man would come on, life insurance guy would come on over to the house. Mom would make herself scarce. She, she didn't want to be around anything that had to do with life insurance, uh, a burial plot, headstone, nothing. She just didn't want to think about it. And so many are like her. And I, I, just, I, just, I just laid it out from the scriptures. That no matter whether you go to heaven or whether you go to hell, if that person would come back, in this life, they both have the same message. Get right with God. Whether you were in hell or whether you were in heaven, your conviction would be the same. Jesus is Lord. And get right with God now. 
You're not promised tomorrow. I shared the story that the first funeral that I ever had to do in my family was my grandpa. And uh, my, my grandparents in some ways helped to raise, uh, particularly my brother and I, and somewhat my sister. And uh, my parents evidently had had some struggles in their marriage when, when uh, Randy and I, I was five, Randy's about three, and so the grandparents very thoughtfully took us off their hands each for a month. So at the end of two months, my mom and dad were doing better, and everybody liked the arrangement. I mean, Grandpa and Grandma liked us there, and Grammy and Grammy liked us there, and Mom and Dad liked the break. And we liked being with the grandparents, amen. <laughs> so we did this literally all the years that I grew up. And so my grandparents are quite close. And yet when my grandpa, who was an atheist, died suddenly. And then my dad asked me to do the funeral. Whoa. It was so hard. Because I knew there was not any more chances. But I preached the best I could. I challenged people to get right with God. I said, hey, if grandpa were to come up from the dead, what would he say? Get right with God. Anyway, at the meal afterwards, I was talking to my sister. Now, my brother became a Christian about a year after me. Of course, the Lord gave him some encouragement, <laughs> gave him cancer, and that, that hurried him on along a little bit. But my sister, when Grandpa died, I'd been a Christian for 16 years. She still hadn't come around. She'd gotten married, divorced, been with several men, remarried, still didn't want to become a Christian. And, and we had one of those talks. You know how only brothers and sisters can have one of those talks? You know what I mean? Yeah. And I said, Dana, why aren't you a Christian? She said, well, I just don't see my need. I said, you've got so many sins. You don't even know what your sins are. I know what my sins are. I said, you don't know the magnitude of your sins. And she just broke down and cried. She says, well, can, can we talk to you, me and Bob? And lo and behold, we went out, talked. A week later, they were both baptized into Christ. Amen, guys? And they're faithful to this day. Why was, why was I so wanting her to be baptized? Well, she was my sister! And I didn't want her to be lost. Has it ever occurred to you that everybody is somebody's sister or brother, dad or mom, son or daughter? And yet, doesn't this blow your mind? There are people who call themselves Christians, disciples, who don't believe in evangelizing the whole world. Turn to Matthew chapter 28. Come on. Yep. Great stuff. In Matthew 28, the last words of Jesus to the eleven faithful, he says in verse 18, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I'm going to be with you always the very end of the age. Right here it's obvious. He says, Go and make disciples of all nations. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Well, what does the Holy Spirit say to leaders? Let's turn to the book of 1 Timothy. Come on, Tim. 1 Timothy explicitly is written to preachers. And yet at the same time, I think we can broaden it to every leader. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, Paul writes, Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Of whom I'm the worst. Paul's saying, hey, if Jesus can convert me, anybody can become a Christian. You know, all of us should have that conviction. Amen, guys? But he came into the world to save sinners. Well, who are the sinners? Everybody in the world. Who needs to be saved? Everybody in the world. Chapter 2. Look what he says right here in verse 3. This is a good... This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. He's speaking to men in that generation. He says, God wants all men to be saved. And you're only saved when you respond to a knowledge of the truth. Look at chapter 3, verse 16. One of the songs that the early church sang, Paul recorded. Beyond all question, the mystery of godliness is great. 
He appeared in a body, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, and was taken up into glory. The early Christians, and 1 Timothy is written mid-60s, sang that the gospel had been preached in all nations. In other words, in that generation. Does that fire you up or not? Look at chapter 4, verse 9. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. He says, you better fully accept this. And for this we labor and strive. That we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially those who believe. Don't you love that or not? Jesus died for all men everywhere. Now we want mom to become a Christian and dad and brother and sister and son and daughter. But everybody is somebody like that. I mean, I'm excited about Dahim getting baptized. And JD's especially excited because that's his son. But guys, are we to be any less committed to winning everybody else's son and daughter? We need to have a deep conviction. This world needs to be saved, and it can be saved if we make disciples. Amen. Now, this next Sunday is Bring Your Neighbor Day. Amen, guys? Are you excited about that? Now, we're going to do it regionally, so that makes it extra easy for your visitors to come. And we need to understand, I mean, we've got extraordinary guys speaking at each one of these services, so you know it is going to be an incredible message. But you know something? For us, we need to understand that we're in a war. And it's going to be a battle to bring people on out. I mean, when you start taking captives from somebody, it's a battle. Satan's going to battle you. Expect resistance. But we need to understand, the war is already raging. It's just a matter of us going into Satan's kingdom, which is this world, and getting back his captives from the false religions that they're held captive by so they can come to hear the word of God and come and hear a knowledge of the truth and so be saved. Are you with me here, church? We need to get a deep conviction that we need to battle for souls. Amen? Secondly, in order to do that, there's a battle in our own hearts. Turn to Romans chapter 7. In Romans 7, in verse 14, Paul shares from his own life. And he says this, We know that the law is spiritual, but I'm unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do I do not do, but what I hate to do. You ever feel that way? And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. And as it is, it's no longer I myself would do it, but sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I, I can't carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do, no, the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Are you still with me right here, guys? Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it's no longer I who do it, but it's sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. Ever felt evil there? Wow. From my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war. Do you get that right there? Waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am who will rescue me from this body of death. Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the church said, Wow. Some people said, well, is this Paul before he became a Christian? Yes. Was it Paul after he became a Christian? Yes. (laughs) He's battling the flesh. But you know, if you don't feel you're in a battle, if you don't feel the struggle, that means you've given in totally. There's a battle in every one of our hearts That's why Jesus called and says, if any man would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, kill it daily, and then follow me. Our hearts 
are self-absorbed, self-accusing, self-consumed, self-deceived, self-exalting, sometimes self-loathing, self-pleasing, self-relying, self-seeking, and bottom line, self-worshipping. That's who we are. Pick which one of those or all of them. Amen. <laughs> we all have that fight. Don't deny it. The person who denies it, the Bible says, is a liar. You need to understand there is a battle. Why? Satan wants to take you captive. And for those people that only want to think the church is the family of God and not the army of God, you are the most susceptible. Because you don't realize the battle that's being raged in your own heart. You know, if there's anything that brings out the battle of the heart, it's the battle for souls. You know, you ever see the, the, the challenge right there? Whenever we're called to go out and preach the word, I mean, that just challenges us to the core. You know, we live in a time where cowardice is lauded as being able to get along with everybody. We live at a time when laziness is rewarded with money from the government. We live at a time where two million houses in the United States were foreclosed this last year. A lot of people say, well, the economic situation changed me. No, you were greedy and you got caught. And the amazing thing is a lot of these people consider themselves expert in finance. What they really were experts in is greed. The indulgement of self. It is the sin of Americans. Greed is in fact the embodiment of the American dream. Bigger and bigger and bigger and better barns. And then you get to eat, drink, and be merry during your retirement. But they forget that in the end, God will call upon your soul. You know the battle for every heart? We see it. We feel it. And the Bible teaches that unless we surrender ourselves, we will lose that battle. Unless we humble ourselves, not just before God, but before men. See, the Bible teaches very explicitly there in Matthew 28 that after you're baptized, then you have to be discipled. You have to be taught to obey the Word of God. And you see, a lot of Christians slowly drift away and fade away because they don't submit themselves to relationships. Now, that's not to say all the advice that you get is right. I mean, we're all human. And, and yet, at the same time, we know that the Bible is never wrong. And we need to understand, church, that if you're not in discipling relationships where people are really in your life, if you're not being transparent, then you're not going to be transformed. You know, there are still, and this, this shocks me, and I found out just uh, two days ago, there are still a few disciples in this church that have discipleship partners in name but aren't meeting with them every week. There are still discipleship partners that are not having daily contact. Good gravy, we've got the cell phone. I mean, it doesn't get any easier than that. I mean, I, even I've learned to text, Amen, bro. <laughs> now, that takes me about a minute and a half to do Amen, brother, because it's really hard to get the exclamation mark. I've got to flick through all those little symbols and stuff. <laughs> so if you have a text message for me and it says, Amen, brother, you know that's a flat labor of love. <laughs> the 
But let me tell you something. I hope you're encouraged that I answered back. How about all those people that don't answer their phone calls, don't answer their text messages, don't answer their emails? You are flat in sin. You say, well, I'm too busy. You're right. You are too busy. Now repent. We, we, we need to understand it is disrespectful. It is ungodly. Can you imagine Jesus not answering an email? Oh, I don't have time for that one. All of us have sent emails to God and he's answered our prayers. How can we do anything less? It shocks me. I, I hear of fellowships where nobody calls anybody. It is garbage. And bottom line, it's just a flat lack of love. And if we're going to call ourselves a discipling church, and that is what we aspire to be. Not perfect, but we, as, we are disciples of Jesus Christ, involved in each other's lives, helping each other walk with the Lord our God. Then by golly, we've got to be like God. And when we get a phone call, answer it in a timely way. A text, an email. Answer it in a timely way because people need that encouragement. See, you've got to win the battle of your heart. You've got to deny self so that you encourage others to win the battle in their heart. Are you with me here, church? Our last point is the battle for the weak. Let's go back to our text in 1 Samuel. In 1 Samuel 30 again, we remember that David, after he turned to the Lord, after everybody turned on him, wanted to kill him. I don't know if you ever had a Bible talk like that, but um, the Lord said, okay, you can defeat the Amalekites, and they do. They get back all the wives, all the sons and daughters. Nobody's killed. They bring back this incredible amount of plunder. And we pick up the reading in verse 21. <clears throat> then David came to the 200 men who had been too exhausted to follow him and were left behind at the Bazar Ravine. They came out to meet David and the people with him. As David and his men approached, he greeted them. But all the evil men and troublemakers amongst David's followers said, Because they did not go out with us, we will not share with them the plunder we recovered. However, each man may take his wife and children and go. David replied, No, my brothers. You must not do that with what the Lord has given us. He has protected us and handed us over to us the forces that came against us. Who will listen to what you say? The share of the man who stayed with the supplies is to be the same as him who went out into battle. All will share alike. David made this a statute and ordinance for Israel from that day to this. Wow. The battle for the exhausted. Or as the New Testament puts it, the battle for the weak. 1 Corinthians 9.19, Paul says, I want to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jew. To the Gentile, I became like a Gentile to win the Gentile. And then he says, to the weak, I became weak to win the weak. He's saying... The same exact pouring out of the heart and denying of self is, it, it, it takes in order to pull the weak back into the family of God. You know, I, I think that it's easy for us to understand that in an army, there's always going to be some tired soldiers. The Bible right here doesn't talk about why these guys were exhausted. Maybe they were the ones that had fought the hardest in the last battle. Or maybe they were just the weaker guys. The Bible's silent, and so we just need to accept it as the fact that there were exhausted men that were numbered as David's faithful soldiers. 400 of them go and win the battle, and they come on back. Now, very interestingly, the Holy Spirit writes the scriptures... And it says that when they came back with the plunder, a group of them came to David. And they said to David, 
hey, these 200, they didn't go out with us. They didn't fight the battle. They just stayed here with the supplies. Give them, give them their wives, their kids, and just get rid of them. Let them make them go home. Isn't it interesting? The Holy Spirit, in verse 22, calls those people evil men and troublemakers. Now, this is, this is a twist. These are the men that we later call the mighty men of God. The most powerful of David's fighters, the Holy Spirit calls in this instance, evil men and troublemakers. These guys were victorious. These guys brought the captives back. They were the strongest soldiers. And yet the Holy Spirit calls them evil men and troublemakers. You know, I think right here is a tremendous challenge for us, the family of God, the sheep of God, the kingdom of God, and the army of God. Is that the weak are always going to be a part of the family of God. The exhausted is always going to be a part of the family of God. Notice these guys didn't just take off from and go AWOL in the army. They did what they were told. Granted, it wasn't quite as glorious, but they stayed with the supplies, and they did their job, and they were faithful. Maybe their works weren't as glorious, but David says to each man will be given the plunder. You know, we need to get a deep conviction that David had that heart after God's own heart. When he understood that even though these men didn't fight as gloriously as the others, they still remained faithful to their charge, even in their exhausted state. Why were these valiant fighters called evil men and troublemakers? Because they had no tolerance for the weak. They had no tolerance for the exhausted in their number. But what, the question comes, what is a weak person? Well, a weak person is a disciple that begins to turn back to be the person he was before he was baptized. And you know the study series, we've got... Seeking God, the Word, discipleship, kingdom, light and darkness, and church. So, a weak disciple is one who, who no longer is seeking God first with all of his heart, but he's begun to turn his heart towards other things in the world. The weak disciple is no longer holding to the Word of God. He's not in the Word of God every day. He's missing quiet times. The weak disciple is, is cowardly in sharing his faith. As a matter of fact, persecution may have hit him and he's been weakened in that struggle and is afraid to share his faith because of more persecution. The weak disciple is no longer striving to go to church. He may miss church services, even minimizing that the church is the kingdom of God. Wow. The weak disciple is the one that returns to the vomit, as Peter says, of the sins of his own life. It's also a person who begins to get fuzzy about the doctrine to be saved. No, he was taught light and darkness. He had to have faith and repent, become a disciple, and be baptized. But he begins to be fuzzy about who's saved and who's lost. That's a weak person. And from the church study... They not only miss services, but they hold back on their pledge. They no longer give money to God because they start thinking, I'm I don't want to give my money to the church. Wow. See, these are all symptoms of being a weak disciple. Now, some of you may be shocked to find out you're a weak disciple. <laughs> so what, what, what do we need to do? Well, first of all, we need to understand it doesn't stop right there. You know, weak disciples have a tendency to grumble and complain and just be frustrating and ornery. Just ornery. You know what I'm talking about right here? Well, 
Well, let's talk about what we need to do. And let's just see where the Bible views where a weak disciple's at. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. I mean, this scripture is going to be good for you, whether you're a strong disciple or weak. Second Timothy chapter 2, beginning of verse 24. And the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. And they will come to their senses and will escape the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Oh my goodness, the devil can come into the church and take Christians captive. That's what's going on in a weak disciple's life. Now let me tell you something, that just gets me ticked off at Satan. But you know, often we get ticked off at the disciple. Why? Because they frustrate us, and that's why he says right here, don't get into a quarrel, don't get into arguments, don't get resentful, or in our vernacular, don't get a bad attitude towards the bad attitudes. Know what I'm talking about right here? He says, you've got to do what? Well, you've got to give them hope in God, give them knowledge of the truth, so they can come to their senses and escape from the trap of the, the devil right here. He is holding them captive. So if you're weak, you need to understand, Satan's got you. And the fear of God should be put in you. And the Bible says you need to turn to God and you need help, discipleship-wise, to get out of that trap. Amen. Are you with me right here, guys? If you're strong, you can't get a bad attitude towards the people that frustrate you. See, that's what happened to those guys. When we went out to battle, we risked our lives against the Amalekites. And these guys just stayed by the luggage. <laughs> wow. Wow. And the Bible calls them evil men and troublemakers because they had no tolerance for the weak. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, in verse 22, Paul says in the body of Christ that the weaker parts are indispensable. Wow. Why? Because every soul is equally important to God. David understood that each man received the same amount of plunder. But the weak are very important in the family of God. You know, if there's anything that is powerful about the way that God made man and God especially made women, it's when a child of ours is hurting or very, very sick. I mean, there is just, when it's our kid, our heart just goes out to them. You know what I'm talking about right here? And there is a power there. There is a, there is something good about the way that God made man. When one of our kids is hurting, there is a love. There, there, I mean, there's nothing like it on earth. And God wants us to be that way towards our brothers and sisters that are hurting and that are weak. There needs to be a powerful, even though they resist us. Even though they may frustrate us. Even though they may miss a church service. Not be having their quiet times. Get fuzzy on the doctrine. We still need to love them. Because just as Jesus loved us the unlovable. Now we need to be like Jesus. And to love the unlovable. And you do that enough times. And you become like Jesus. Are you with me right here? See that is why we need our weak brothers and sisters. You know. A couple weekends ago, Elaine and I had the opportunity to go to the inaugural service for the Portland International Christian Church. It was incredible. They now have 66 disciples, and visiting were six from Phoenix, uh, five other disciples here from L.A., and uh, 50 disciples from Eugene. And you talk about a sense of oneness in the auditorium. It was awesome. I mean, the singing was incredible. But... uh, The thing, of course, that's always special is when you get to see a miracle right in front of your eyes. And uh, that day, not only did two people place membership, but we had a young woman get baptized into Christ. 
She's a single mom, Lucia. And she was so humbled by her life circumstances. And then, and then to see just her tears. I mean, she could barely get through her good confession. And, you know, we were also like, come on, sis, come on, make it, you know. And, and your heart just goes out because you know she is being freed of those chains that have held her captive for so long. And she's becoming our sister in Christ and daughter of God, a miracle before our very eyes. And then I think, as time goes by, perhaps even a smidge more amazing to me are people who have fallen away that come back to God. You know, it's amazing how encouraging a baptism is, amen? But you know, a fall away is even more discouraging. But then a person who comes back is amazing. I mean, that, that day, it was so awesome because... Ezekiel Gonzalez got restored. He was one of them. And that's, that's, that's Victor's kid. And you know, a lot of us get a little bit frustrated with some of the kingdom kids. Because they're acting out. They're, they're doing this or they're doing that. We got an attitude towards them. And they must be silenced. I wish their parents would deal with them. You know, here's the thing. Dude, when you get married... And you have kids. Those are called kingdom kids. And you better have the kind of love that is going to bring them into the kingdom. And remember that everybody's kids, they may be acting out, and we all agree that's sin, that's wrong, amen, needs to be dealt with. But at the end of the day, these unlovable kids who are really just trying to test us are really our path to becoming more like Jesus. They're God's gift to us. To practice not being frustrated, but to love the unlovable. Is that awesome or not? You know, I was excited. Juan Ortiz was restored that day. And Juan, Juan, Juan has this terrible past before he comes into the kingdom. Believe it or not, when he fell away, his life became even worse. Just like the scriptures talk about. Like a dog returns to its vomit. You ever seen a dog lapping up its vomit? <laughs> now, I, I never have. I just didn't wonder if you had. But I have seen a cat lick up its vomit. And that has to be the grossest thing. I mean, is that gross or not? It's just gross. That's what it's like when you fall away. How much more exciting then is it when this person comes back? And then lastly, a brother named Chris Williams was restored. Now, granted, Chris had totally stopped reading his Bible, totally stopped praying, totally stopped giving, only came to Sunday church, but he still was in church. Yeah! You can fall away and still come to church on Sunday morning. See, if you don't deal with your life when you're weak, in time you become lukewarm. What's the difference between weak and lukewarm? Well, the weak still want to be in the army. They still want to fight. They still want to do something. The lukewarms, they're fading. And then, after lukewarm, you totally fall away. And you can come to church. And be fallen away. When Chris gave his heart, I mean, it was just incredible. It was incredible that day. You know, it's early in this year. And yet I really believe this is going to be a year of even greater things for the whole congregation. Um, I, I, I sense a health in the church, a vibrancy, a zeal. A deeper love, a deeper conviction. I mean, the Lord has, if we didn't downside our lives, the Lord has been downsizing for us. You know what I'm talking about right here? I mean, there's been a great discipling in the church. And, and, and we're, we're appreciative of that discipling. But we need to have as a deep conviction that as much as J.D. wanted his son Dahim baptized... And he'll get to see that today. So everybody in every nation needs to be saved. In order to do that, bottom line, 
We're going to have to fight the battle for every soul. The battle inside of our own hearts and the battle for the weak. If we do that, God will make us victorious. And we will be able to sing one day around the throne of the Lord. The world was evangelized in our day. Thank you and God bless you.